hear me fine? Cool. All right, thank you very much everyone for joining me today. Um, yeah, I'm here to show you a little bit uh, about dev experience. So I'm going to talk about how to Tubo charge your dev experience using Tubo Hepo. A um, little bit about me. Uh, my name is, is Bruno. I'm the tech lead in this cool company called N26. I'm, I'm leading a team there where we're building the client platform. So I kind of like building the, the tools and foundation for all the web engineers to build up the features on top of it. So I'm kind of like just pushing for better dev experience uh, on my day to day. Uh, I'm currently uh, working in a team of three engineers. Uh, we don't like to call ourself, ourselves uh, DevOps. We like to call ourselves DevOps. So I basically help you to ship divs as fast as possible. So that's basically my job. Um, I'm also a big fan of Nintendo games. So who here is playing? The, who is waiting for the next Zelda game? Because I'm really looking forward for this game. It's going to be cool. Um, so yeah, let's just jump right in. Um, but before I, I, I talk about Tube Repo, I want to talk about how companies organize their code base. Right? Like, there are a few approaches, and you're probably familiar with some of them. Um, and I want to talk about multi-repos and monorepos. So who here has been working with monorepos? Cool, a bunch of hands, that's nice. And how about multiple repos at your company? Nice, okay. So, yeah. So basically, like the most common one in, in large companies, specifically, it's to go through this process of having separate uh, repositories, right? You have your GitHub account, you have several repos there, and then teams work separately. So I just craft this little example here with, uh, where, where I have, I'm building like a React in the shop, and then there is the web shop, there is the admin uh, app, and then there is the UI. So basically, the React component library shared across all, all those apps. Um, and this is a reasonable approach, right? Like teams want to be independent. They want to be autonomous. So they want to choose their stack. They want to um, move fast. And they want to make sure they're not breaking the features from other teams, right? So that's a very reasonable way of organizing uh, your code base. Um, but what if there was another way? So basically, monorepo is the, the way that some companies are adopting now. Uh, and it's just meshing them together in the same repository. Of course, it's just not like a monolith, right? Sometimes people confuse monorepos with monoliths. A monorepo, it's basically a way of structuring your code base. But you can still have microservices there, for example, or micro frontends, for example. You can still have them in a monorepo. The difference is that they're all in the same repository, right? And you might ask yourself, um, yeah, so companies were using multiple repositories because, because they want autonomy, right? They want to be independent. They want their teams to be fully independent. But why monorepos are so hot right now? Why people are speaking about them? Why big companies are using monorepos, right? We see Google, Netflix, Facebook, Twitter are all using monorepos in some shape or form. Uh, Google, for example, created this tool called Bazel, which is open source. It's basically a tool to help you manage monorepos. Facebook and Twitter did the same thing. Um, but those tools are really focused on C++, Java, so it's a different, uh, it's not very friendly with JavaScript and TypeScript repositories. Um, but still, they're really investing in those tools, they're really investing in monorepos, right? There might be a reason why they are not choosing to go with different repositories. And one of them, it's called reuse, right? It's just so much easier to share code with your team. If you have, you know, uh, like for example, in this, this little demo here, I put like a models package there that's sharing your database models. So if you have two different apps that need those database, those database models, you can just reuse them across the same repo. If you're working different teams with different code bases, then you're probably dupli duplicating that. It's very hard to share. You might have to extract that in a library, publish that to NPM, and then people can use them. Then you have to version it then it becomes way more difficult to, to, to make those teams to work in sync, right? In a monorepo, then it's just much, much easier. Um, the second point here is the is shared standards. Um, in a monorepo, it's also much easier to make sure that your team is using the same standards. So if, you're, if you want to enforce CS lint rules, for example, you can do that once, and then you can share across your entire repository. You could have like hundreds of apps there, libraries, but they can still follow the same rules in a much easier way. If you have separate repos, well, 
that's a much harder thing to do because then you have to make sure that people are actually using your library, your rules, and so on. Um, if you're using TypeScript, then it's also simpler, super simple to share a TypeScript configuration, right? You can still have several different ways of, of exporting this configuration. For example, if you have a client-side library, you can have like a TypeScript configuration for that. If you have a Next.js app, you can have a TypeScript configuration for that. But you can ensure that they're actually using good standards. And then, like I said, a shared database model is the best example. If you are accessing the database, then you have it there already. Um, another point here that I want to mention, which is like I'm experienced that every day at, at N26, is team collaboration. We work in a monorepo with around 35 engineers. And we have four different apps there, like uh, server-side apps. And we have using React. And we also have a few libraries, like, for example, our, our design system library. We have also all the libraries that we share across the monorepo. Like, we have around 20 packages at the moment. And the team collaboration is just so much higher than my experience working in different companies with, without monorepos. Because think about it. You don't have to context switch anymore. You have everything already set up there. You have your node version installed. You have TypeScript. You have all the dependencies. You have everything already set up. So when an engineer needs to pair program with you, you just sit down and do the work. You don't have to figure out how to clone a repository, install dependencies, you know, sync SDKs, and you might need another dependency that's not declared there, and somebody else knows which dependency you need. But if you have a monorepo, then it's much easier. Everybody's already there. Just jump in, check out the branch, you know, do your pair programming session. That's it. Another thing that's super cool is PR reviews. We go to GitHub. We have everything there in the same repository. The changes are all there, and then we can just review codes m much, much easier. Um, and I have been experiencing that for the almost two years, the past almost two years, and it's been really amazing. It's really like a huge ex uh, uh, um, uh, experience boost and performance boost for the team. Um, another thing that's super cool about the monorepo, it's atomic changes. So if you have three different apps or packages, and they somehow depend on each other, you might even think that, oh, uh, I can split them up in separate repositories, and I can do changes independently. Mm, that's not really true for all cases, though. Some apps or libraries, they depend on each other. Like, think about a system that has uh, order, and then it has a checkout that you have to pay. I mean, those things, they go hand in hand. You can't break the payment. Uh, you can't break the checkout process without breaking the payment. It's, it's very tricky to get this right. So those teams, they need to communicate. But if you have everything in the same repository, then those teams are already communicating. You know? Everything is already there. If they break something, they're going to see that in CI. So if you make those changes across those packages and you push your pull request there, all those, those packages, they will have their own test suite, you know, their own pipelines. And then they, go, they, go, they, they are going to break eventually. And you're going to see it, and you're going to fix it. And it's just much, much easier. Uh, last but not least, um, isolation, it's a biggest selling point for, for multiple repositories. And this is where, uh, this is where monorepos can still gi give you this sense of isolation, because you can still have your packages scoped down to be like fully self-contained, so they are not really like depending on anything else. If they do depend on other packages or libraries, you still have to explicitly declare them, right? Um, once we, we are going to jump in, in the demo and we're going to see how this works. But if one package depends on, on another package inside of the monorepo, there are ways to specify that and say, hey, I need this package to be available for me so that I can use it. It's not just something that you just use, and then things can break at, at any moment. Um, so yeah, with this in mind, um, we, it seems like we got the whole uh, package thing sorted, right? So it seems like we can actually, today, we can have like a solid monorepo in Java, especially for JavaScript and TypeScript projects, thanks to workspaces. So this is something that's available for all the package managers out there, YAN and PM and PNPM. My demo is using PNPM, but it works in the same way from, from NPN and YAN. It's exactly the same way. Um, so this is sorted. So you can actually have a cool monorepo that has those dependencies declared. Everything works in a nice way. But there's still a big challenge, though. Um, running tasks efficiently in a monorepo, it's a really, it's a big nightmare if you're just using like a plain workspaces. Um, it works, but it's kind of like not very efficient. Things work serially, so you have to wait for one task to, to, to finish, so then you can execute next and so on. 
but that was, but that's actually in the past because uh, uh, now we have a solution for it, which is Turbo Repo. Turbo Repo came out. Uh, I think it came out open source in the beginning of the year. It was a tool written by Jared Palmer. I'm pretty sure you know this guy. He wrote a bunch of cool libraries for React, like Formic, for example. And today they are part of Vessel, so it's still open source too, but it's fully baked in the Vessel ecosystem. So if you're using Vessel today, that's a pretty cool tool that you should consider using because they, they provide you all the features that I'm going to talk about. So Turbo Repo is actually a build system for monorepos, but it's specifically built for TypeScript and JavaScript monorepos. So remember that I mentioned that Google made a tool called Bazel, but it was really not really that wasn't really friendly for JavaScript and TypeScript. This one is actually solving this problem, and it's solving really, really well. You, you're going to see that in the demo. So let's talk about the features that Turbo Repo can provide you. So the first one is that Turbo Repo helps you to never do the same work twice. So if you did a build or a test or a lint task, whatever you did, Turbo Repo is going to remember that. And then if you try to do it again for package A, but you changed package B, Turbo Repo will say, hey, you have done this task already for package A. You don't have to do it again. Here are the logs of this task. You can just check it again. And that's just milliseconds. That's super fast. But then if you actually change something, then Turbo Repo is going to execute this, uh, this task that you told it to execute. You're going to see that in a moment in the demo. Um, another thing that's super cool about Turbo Repo, which is something that they really solved pretty well, is optimized scheduling. So if you have, think about it, if you have a, a laptop now, super cool M1 with 100 cores, it's like super fast machines, then you're doing like a, you're running your test suite all written in jest. And you have like 100 monorepo, um, around the packages in your, mo your monorepo. And you want to run the tests, and then you have to wait all of them to run after each other, right? But with Turbo Repo, it's super easy to specify these dependencies between pa packages. And then Turbo, it's going to just like run all of them in parallel as much as possible, and then it's going to give you the results in a much, much, uh, uh, in a much, much faster way. Uh, Turbo also figures out the dependency between tasks, and that's also a very big one, uh, which you can kind of like get away already with uh, monorepos without Turbo, but it's just not very efficient. So Turbo can actually figure out, hey, I can actually do these tasks here in parallel. For example, linting is a good one. Usually, when you're using ESLint, you can just do it across your entire code base. They don't really depend on each other because the code can just be linted independently. Uh, but for example, a build, it's a different task. Sometimes you need to build a library first, and then you can build your uh, web app, for example. There are ways to optimize this, but that would be like the simple way to do it. And then Tubo can also figure out that. And then, hey, I'm going to build the UI library first to make sure that the components are ready. And then I'm going to build the web app now. And then everything's going to work at the end. Uh, another thing that takes caching to the next level is distributed remote, remote caching. And that's where Tubo really shines. Remember that I said that Tubo doesn't do the same work twice? And that's not only true for your machine, though. That's also true for your colleagues working in the same team, and also true for your CI runners. So if you did a test or a lint or a build locally on your code base, your program, and you changed like two packages, you did a test there, Tubo can upload this cache to a remote server that I have implemented one here I'm going to show you. And then once the same task in the same code base is working, it's running in a CI environment like GitHub Actions, Tubo is going to remember that, and it's going to fetch from the remote server and it's going to show you the logs. So it's going to save you a lot of time. Uh, imagine that you have a monorepo with 100 packages, and then you're changing just one package. You don't want to run tests for 100 packages, right? You just want to run the tests for this package that you change. Uh, but Turbo is smart enough to know that, and then it's going to show, it's going to run the, the test just for this package, and it's going to show you the logs from the other package. So you still get like, an amazing output from your monorepo. And you still know which packages actually run and which packages actually just hit the cache. Uh, last but not, uh, not at least, uh, Turbo has zero runtime overhead, which means that it really stops at your CI environment and develop machine. It doesn't go to your production build. It just helps you to build and do development locally in a very optimized way. But once you build your app and you want to ship to production, Turbo gets out of the way. It's just a dev dependency, and then you're done. So that's, uh, that's really cool, because then you don't have to, your packages actually don't even know that Turbo exists. Like, there's zero dependency between your packages and Turbo. You're going to see that in a moment. 
Uh, cool. So enough talking, right? So let's go for a little live demo. Um, here I have prepared like a little demo a project. You can scan. You can also access this link. You don't have to follow along. You don't have to clone anything locally. You're going to do it right now. But it's cool if you want to get a little reference from a monorepo. Um, it's a small repository, but it's good enough to show you how Tuba works. So let's just, just r jump right in. All right, so let me just walk you through here. Have VS Code open with my monorepo, and I have three important packages here. That's the ones that I showed you in the slide. So we have two apps. Under this apps folder, I have the admin app, which is a Next.js app, plain Next.js app. There's nothing special about it. Uh, and this app is just meant for you know, managing orders, refunding orders, seeing customers, and so on. Here, I have the shop app. Can you guys see just fine? Oh, I'm in front of it. Um, here in the shop app, it's basically where customers go in, you know, buy their t-shirts. It's a cool React India shop. And then they can buy the t-shirts and so on. Uh, but here, inside of packages, I have three more packages. Um, one of them is our ESLint config. So it's kind of like a shared ESLint configuration that can be shared across all the packages. We have the TS config. That's also a shared configuration for TypeScript. Uh, you do it once. You share it everywhere. And then we have a UI library. So this is uh, uh, where you can build your component library inside of a monorepo, and it's fully independent. So let's just take a look at inside of the UI library. If you look inside of it, we have pretty much the same thing that you have in an independent repository. It's, it just really looks like an independent repository. You have your package.json file. You have all your dependencies declared here. You have all your scripts declared here in the same way you do in a separate repository. It's exactly the same way. The only difference is that you, if you're depend, depending on, on uh, packages inside of the monorepo, there is a cool way to declare this dependency I'm going to show you. Um, and here, uh, at the top level of our repository, we have another package.json file. If you don't work with uh, monorepos, don't worry about it. This is simple, straightforward. You can, you can try it out later. But uh, at the top level of your monorepo, usually you have a package.json file that is responsible for managing dependencies that's owned by your monorepo. So it, it has nothing to do with the package itself. For example, Turbo is one uh, dependency that's like just meant to be used inside of the monorepo for any tasks. Your package don't even care about it. And then you know, once you're done, Turbo gets out of the way. So that's, uh, that's the job of the main package.json file. And inside here, I have a dev command, just like you probably do with Next.js or your React apps. I'm going to explain how this command works, but let's just try it out. Let me open my terminal here. And then I'm going to do a pnpm dev. By the way, I'm using pnpm, but it works in the same way as npm or yarn. It's not very different. You can have the commands in the same way. And then I'm going to do a dev command here. I'm already leveraging Turbo for doing local development. Uh, why this is important? Because I'm doing development across two different apps right? that I mentioned to you, and then the component library. And I want all of them to react to my changes. And Turbo is just running the development server for all of them at once in one single terminal session. If you didn't have that, you probably had to open like several terminal sessions, you know, do a dev command inside of your packages, and that would be a hassle. Or you could also optimize that in different ways using one terminal shell. But it's still, it's still a little bit tricky. So let's see how this looks in, um, in our browser. So I have here the React Indie Shop, very simple, Next.js app. It doesn't do anything. Just try to add stuff to the basket. Not very special, just a mock app. And then here, I have my admin app, which is also like a fully independent app, right? Uh, if you notice something, they're sharing like a little button, right? This button looks not so fancy. Don't judge me about my CSS skills, sorry. Um, but they are the same. So they're coming from this uh, UI component library that I showed you guys before. So let's just, just come here to our li library, and let's change something there and see how this works. So I'm going to SRC. I'm opening the button. There's just one single component. That's, I think that's the smallest, the smallest component library out there. And there's a very fancy CSS here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the, I'm going to change the color, the background color of the button to purple. And let's see in our app. You see, it's already, oh, sorry. It's already showing you uh, uh, the diff, right? So it's 
it's working. I'm changing stuff in a separate package that's completely independent from, from my Next.js apps. But this is working just fine, the same way you're doing your own single repository. Imagine that you had uh, this component library in a different repository. How, how much difficult this would be to do this, right? You'd have to try out in a different playground and then publish the library. Your Next.js app would need to update it and then get this new uh, version of the library. And maybe there's a bug there, and then you need to release a patch and so on. That would be a nightmare. So this is one thing that Tubo helps you with local development in a super easy way. Uh, and how does this work? Let's check the package.json file again. Um, I have the dev command here, and it uses this special keyword called Tubo, right? So that's how uh, you use Tubo repo. It's just a dev dependency. I'm declaring it here. I'm using the latest version. Uh, but Tubo is, is, is using this command run with the dev key here. Basically, Tubo, what, what you're telling to Tubo is like, hey, look at all my packages inside of the monorepo. Check if there is a dev script there. If there is a dev script there, run this command. Tubo doesn't even know that it's a dev command. It just knows that's a dev key. You know? If it's firing up a dev server, fine. If it's doing a build, it could also do a build. It doesn't matter for Tubo. And then it just spins up this dev command in those packages. And if you pass this parallel flag here, Tubo just ignores any dependency between them and then just runs the server uh, directly. It doesn't, doesn't care. Because, for example, in the admin in the shop app, they depend on the UI library. Remember that I mentioned this dependency graph? So they depend on the UI library to be built first. But during development, you want them to, to just run in parallel. You don't care about this cache because the dev server will build this again. Um, cool. So I have some other tasks here um, that I want to show you. So I have, changed the, I have changed my button here, right? So let me stop the dev server. I'm going to stop the dev server here. And you notice that I just changed this button here, right? So let's check if I have any changes here. So I have just this button changed. So I'm going to run, I'm going to run another task here. I'm going to run the pnpm lint. And this is also leveraging double. So let's see how this is going to work. Um, it, run, it ran something here. Um, but then the output is a um, little interesting. So we have, um, we have something here from Tobo that says UI lint. So it's actually running the lint command from the lint task from the UI library. And we see it here, there is a cache miss. So remember that I mentioned to you that Tobo only does, uh, uh, tries to avoid doing the same work twice. So it actually knows that I changed the button component inside of the UI library, and it actually just runs again. It's a cache miss because the files change. But for, all, for the other libraries, for example, the shop app here, we see a cache hit. And you see it just says replaying output. And that's where it really shines, because it just skipped them entirely. Admin was the same thing. It just skipped them entirely and just show the outputs of the tasks here. We can even see them here, like, for example, shopping lint, next lint, no yes link warnings, and so on. It's basically the exact same output. If you have a task that generates the same output with the same input, then Tubo can cache. If this output is dynamic, then Tubo uh, it's a little bit more, more um, strict on that. Um, but cool, we did the linting task here. I'm going to run the test task here as well. So pnpm test. By the way, I'm always referencing the, the top level package here. So I'm going to execute this one, tests. Also using Turbo. So now, what we see here, it's a little bit different. Um, remember that I said that Turbo only look for the dev key when I'm running dev commands? It's exactly the same for any task. So now I'm telling Turbo to run the test task across all the packages that, I have a, that, that they have a test command. In this case, I only have tests set up in my UI library. So that's why we see here just UI and then something else. But it also runs the build command here for the test, uh, for the UI library, right? So I, I didn't tell it to run the build. I just told it to run the test. That's a little bit weird, right? Uh, but this is also leveraging something that Turbo requires you to do. The only thing that you need to do when you install Turbo in a monorepo is to create this file called turbo.json. And that's where the magic happens uh, across your monorepo. This file is very simple. Uh, it, you don't have to, to to change it so much, but you just have to understand this com concept of pipelines. What are pipelines? Basically, pipelines is a way 
of you declaring in a monorepo how tasks depend on each other. That's how you make sure that, you know, tell Turbo, hey, this task depends on this task, so please make sure that they run in the right sequence. If they don't have any dependencies, then just run them in parallel. So here we have the dev command that I showed you before, and I have it declared here, and then it says cache false. This means that Turbo will never generate a cache, which means that you always want the fresh stuff, right? You're doing development, you don't care about the cache. Lint command, it's a little bit similar, but it doesn't have a cache false there. By default, cache is true. So basically, when you run a lint task, Turbo is going to cache that. It also says here, outputs, and it's an empty array, which means that this task doesn't generate anything. It just generates logs, but it doesn't generate any reports. Same thing goes for tests. There is no output here. It's an empty array, right? It doesn't generate anything. You could have your test generating a report, like, for example, you know, some report that you push it to a different uh, server to do analysis, like Sonicube, for example. Uh, but there is another one here called depends on. And that's a very interesting one. It says, look, whenever you run a test task, make sure that every dependency that I depend on run the build command. And that's why there is a little caret here. This little caret says, do the build for my dependencies. And if I have a build task in myself as well, just do it. And if we look at the, if we look at the package.json file inside of our library, we will see that we do have a build command. And we do have a test command here. Right? So that's how Turbo knew that it should run the build command first. Cool. So let's run another task here. For example, oh, where is my pen? OK. OK. Sorry about that. So let's run PNPN. Did I run the test? I did already, right? I did run my test again now, and I got a very fast output. And why is that? I mean, Turbo did this task already, right? So now we see here at the end that two tasks were executed success successfully, and then two, two, two of them were cached. And it's a full Turbo. Whenever you see a full Turbo, you should be super happy. Because basically, you didn't waste any CPU cycles. The Turbo, Turbo repo just fetched all the caches and then just replayed the logs for you. Cool. Let's try to do the, let's try to do the lint task here. Full Turbo again, right? I have done this already in the past. I've shown you Turbo is just caching. And now I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to remove those caches from my local machine. And Turbo caches it at the uh, node modules.cache folder. I'm going to remove this folder. And now I'm going to run the lint again. Let's see what's going to happen. Let's see if the internet helps me. We should be able to see full Turbo. It's taking forever. Yeah, this is wrong. Hmm. OK, I'm not sure if my internet is working. OK, cool. OK, it took a while. I think the internet was just slow. But why this was so slow? Because the internet was slow. But you see the full turbo again there? It's because it fetched the cache from my remote server. Um, if you're using Vercel, you get this for free. It's super easy to do it. It's super cool. If you're not using Vercel, I have written my own uh, uh, distributed remote caching backend that you can use. It's open source. I'm going to share the link with you at the end. And this is running in, in DigitalOcean now just to demo this to you. And this is fetching from there. So you see full tool there. Let's try the test again. Um, NPM test. Let's see. Hopefully, it doesn't take forever. Yeah, that was fast. OK, took one second, full turbo again. It fetched all the cache. Now, let's go to the next level. I promised you that if you do cache once, you should sh share everywhere, right? So let me see my changes. Yeah, I'm going to commit those changes. And we will see if our CI runners will pick this up. So I'm going to just do but Ah, OK. Ah, shit. Yeah, it's probably my. Okay, yeah, now it should work. There we go. So let's push this to GitHub. And then let's see what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to my uh, repo here. 
That's the one that I, I shared with you in the QR code. It's going to be available to you anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, let's see. I mean, I'm going to refresh this. And then I pushed straight to master. So there is a CI job running here, right? I'm going to check this. And this should be doing something. So in my CI here, I'm just running lint and test. I could have been running build as well, which is also something that's important for you to do. I didn't do it because it, it would take a little while. And then let's see what's happening here. Um, it, it, there's a bunch of setup here to make sure that PMPN and node is installed. You don't have to worry ab uh, about this. But let's see the checks. This is the one that I actually wrote. This is executing a command called pnpmci. And where this is coming from? This is coming from my package.json file, again, from the root library. And then it says CI, I have a turbo run, lint, and test. So this is how you tell turbo to run multiple tasks as fast as possible, you know, as much as possible in parallel. That's how turbo handles it. Um, so turbo is doing that here in my CI runner. And you see it, it runs this task lint and test here. I'm not sure if it's easy to read. Uh, but you see all the output here, UI build, you, uh, admin lint, uh, UI test. But here at the end, we see full turbo again, you see? So this is the magic. I'm sharing the cache that are generated locally in my machine with my CI runners and we also with my coworkers. So imagine that you have like 30, 40 people working in your team. If they're all doing build, lint, test, and stuff locally, they're all sharing this cache with everyone else. And Turbo is just making sure that everyone is in sync. And that's pretty awesome. So that's pretty much what I want to show you. If there are two takeaways that you can take from this talk, is that Turbo is going to help you to scale your team. Uh, so if you have a monorepo and you have a big team, Turbo is going to help you to do that. And Turbo is going to make sure that all your teammates, they share the same you know, cache and results. So this is how you actually really scale this, because then you don't do any recomputation. You don't waste CPU cycles. But that's it. That's my talk. Thank you very much, everyone.